If you would please open up your Bibles to James, the fourth chapter, and I'd like to go over a few verses that we find there before we launch into our main thought for the lesson this morning. As James is writing here, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says there, starting with verse 1, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The words that we find in this passage are very clear, and really, if we're to be honest with ourselves, they're blunt. He says, do you not realize that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And if you want to pull out a a dictionary, you can, but enmity is just the opposite of friendship. It's being one's enemy. It's being opposed to something. James is making it clear we cannot have both. We cannot have friendship with the world and think that we're going to, at the same time, have friendship with the Lord. It just doesn't work that way. So as we go through the lesson for this morning, we're asking this question of, in our lives, and this is a question only each and every one of us can answer, no one can answer it for you, how much influence on a day-to-day basis, week-to-week basis, however you want to view it, how much influence in your life comes from the world? We realize there are a lot of different things that as we go through life that are going to influence us, some more, some less. Maybe it was your, your parents or another family member, a grandparent, an aunt or an uncle. Maybe it was a, a certain teacher you had going through school or, or an employer you had, one boss who really came across to you as someone you could look up to, someone you could respect, someone who is a leader. It could come from anyone or from anywhere. And sadly, that's one of the main things we're looking at in the lesson for this morning is just how many different sources we have coming at us, bombarding us with different influences and different ideas. And not very many of them, of course, are for our betterment. Not many of them are for our good. You know, you look at where we are today in this society in particular, and from the moment we we wake up, how much do we have just coming at us from radio? TV, internet, it's it's all day long. You can't get away from people throwing out their thoughts and their opinions and trying to tell us what we ought to think and what we ought to do, trying to influence us. Now, this lesson is not going to be completely pessimistic because there are things out there to influence us for good, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but just putting it in these types of terms of what is coming from the world and when we say the world, let's be understood that we're, we're just talking about those who are living for this life, who are all about the here, the now, the physical pleasures, the gratification, the money, the possessions, all of that, versus how much of our influence is coming from God, coming from His Word. How much of that influence is coming from people who are trying to live a godly life? And looking at those two, which one is, is making more of a difference, more of an impact on our lives? So, but like we said, this is a question that we can only ever answer for ourselves. No one else knows our, our hearts, our minds like, like we do. But the first thing we want to say is we're looking at this question, we're just trying to take an account of our lives, of how much you know, is coming in, how much are we listening to, paying attention to, of how much influence comes from the world. The main thing we can say is more than there should. Let's just say that right out the gate. How much influence in our lives is coming from the world, doesn't matter if it's TV or radio or wherever, how much is coming into our lives more than there should be. We often use the phrase that Christians are to be in the world, but not of the world. And while that phrase is completely true, you you think about what it's saying and the meaning behind it, the thought there is completely biblical. 
we have verse after verse, and we're going to look at a few here in just a second to back up that claim. You're never going to find that exact phrase used in the scriptures. Not that I'm aware of. Maybe there's some paraphrase, some translation out there that does put those exact words in that exact order. We don't find it in the scriptures, but that thought, that principle is there. That we are to be in the world, but not of the world. We're not to be like the world that is around us. I mean, we just read that in James. That we're not to have this friendship with the world. We're not to have that kind of intimacy, that kind of connection with them. And that thought in mind just bearing that in mind, that we're to be in the world but not of the world, what does that say about how much the things of, of this life affect us? <clears throat> and I apologize, it's supposed to say Titus chapter 3. In Titus chapter 3, starting with verse 9 there, it says, But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, have after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. You know, these things that we get so caught up in in the world, you know, what do they, what do, they do for us in our lives? How are, they, how are they helping us? And, you know, looking over uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, there in verses 9 and 10, where Paul was writing to Timothy, there he says, Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love, with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. You know, this man Demas, who's mentioned here, and he's mentioned, I think, maybe two other places in the scriptures, he's not brought up very often, but this is the main thing he's remembered for, is what Paul says right here, that he is in love with this present world. And it's so sad. In the other places he's mentioned, he's mentioned as a a traveling companion of Paul. He's mentioned as someone who helped him on these missionary journeys, someone who was a brother, a sound worker for the gospel. He was someone who was a member of the Lord's church. And now Paul says he is in love with this present world and deserted him. And that's what I really want to focus on for just a moment here. If we understand that, well, we know we're in the world and we know we're not to be of the world. And, and yes, you know, on a, in an ideal situation, we would have no influence from the world. Like we said, how much does the world influence? More than, more than it should. Because it should have zero. But no one's perfect. And it's, it's an imperfect world. And maybe we use that as an excuse. But then also maybe we start getting into this idea of, of relativity. Well, as long as I don't you know, go so far, as long as I keep that in the back of my mind, then maybe it would be okay. You know, we read this passage, Demas is in love with this present world. And for us in our lives, we would describe ourselves and say, well, I don't, I don't love the world. Love's a big commitment. It's, you know, it's something that a lot of people are even afraid to say. They're afraid to tell the people that they love them because they know there's meaning, there's power behind that world. So we'd look at our lives and say, well, as, as long as I don't love the world, as long as I'm not like Demas, then, then I'd be okay. I just kind of like the world. It, it's a casual interest, you know? That's what we talk about. But think about that. You know, we might tell ourselves, well, I don't love the world. Maybe you don't see it as that. Maybe you're getting caught up on that word, but how do you really feel about the world and what it's doing to you in your life? Because we have to keep in mind, the world is going to tell us what it thinks is important. All day long, from the moment we wake up, Internet, TV, radio, our friends and co-workers that aren't Christians, that don't, uh, don't have an interest or, or care what God's Word has to say, they're going to be giving us their opinion. If there's one thing people like to do, it's sharing what they think. It's putting their opinion out there. And the world is not going to stop telling us what it thinks is important. Now, most of the time, it's just trying to sell us something, but it's going to tell us, you know, what we need to be thinking, what we need to be doing, and how we ought to react in any given situation. We need to understand that that is going to have an effect on us, that no one is so strong that they're immune to that, and we have to understand that it's not okay for us to draw a line and say, well, as long as I don't go this far, I can listen so much as long as I don't really go along with it in the end. We draw a line there between love and like, and we try to come up with all different types of words to justify 
this kind of behavior, understanding that the world is going to influence us. And it sometimes feels that we're surrendering, that we're just kind of giving up because we understand, well, we can never have zero influence from the world. So since we know we can't win, then why bother even trying? But that's a defeatist attitude. And it's certainly not one that we see within God's word. Over in Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, before the Apostle Paul writing here lists the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, there in verses 16 and 17, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the flesh, uh, Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And he's just highlighting here this inner struggle. When we understand God's word, when we come to a knowledge and obedience of the truth, then we know right from wrong. But there's this struggle, never-ending battle between us, between doing what we know is right and then doing what is easy, what is convenient, or what we would want to do. And if we're honest with ourselves, we know there are things that appeal to us, that look good. That's what temptation is. Things that we want to do that are opposed to what we know we ought to be doing. And so there's already this inner battle between, between our, the spirit and the flesh in all of us. And of course, when we listen to the world, they're not going to care about the spirit. They're not interested in what God's word has to say. They might try to use it for something, spin it to make something sound good, to make it sound like it's spiritual in nature. But the things of this world, by their very nature, by their very definition, are opposed to God. They don't care about God because they're focused on the here and now. They're looking at the physical. They're not, they're not focused on the spiritual. They don't care about the fruit of the spirit. So what are we listening to? What are we paying attention to? And what are we doing when it comes to this inner struggle that we face between what we know is right, what we have telling us from the spirit what we ought to do and how we ought to live, versus the world telling us, well, you need to go out there. And you need to make something of yourself. And you need to have the... the best car and the biggest house and the nicest job that's what the world is doing it's influencing us to have all that to want all of that and to leave God behind now someone can be successful in business and in all facets of life and still be a godly person but of course the world tends to leave that part out they might never say anything outright against it because they don't want to offend anybody they don't want to lose any potential sales but they're certainly not going to bring it up because it's not important to them. It's not a priority. But the main thing we're talking about when we examine this question of how much does the world influence me? How much does this change me and impact me? And it happens, you know, little by little. It doesn't happen all at once. It doesn't happen overnight. How much is this affecting me in my life of all these things I'm hearing and seeing from the world and commercials and in my coworkers? Yes, we know it's more than there should. Because ideally, in a perfect world, we would have zero influence from the world. But that having been said, we understand that. The real answer to this question is that how much influence in our lives comes from the world is as much as we allow. Plain and simple. There are a lot of things in this life that we do inadvertently that we do without knowing it, without understanding it. You know, accidents happen and, and some things happen without our, our knowledge or without our consent. But when you talk about being influenced by the world, that the things that we say, the attitudes that we have, the way we talk to people, how much that comes from the world is exactly as much as we let come in from the world. It's not going to happen without us knowing about it. It happens, maybe we don't think it's happening, but it happens when we put ourselves out there in the world, when we let all of that come in. And again, going back to that idea, what we read there concerning Demas, that he was in love with this present world. What does it mean to love the world? Love's a pretty big word. That's a big commitment. It means you are emotionally invested. You are tied into that. And we would think in our lives, well, we don't love the world. We're not that type of person. We're not, we're not godless in our life. Well, I didn't say you were. Someone can still have faith in God, but still be thinking in worldly terms. 
Why do we dress the way that we do? Current fashion trends? Why do we say the things that we say? What are the, the common words that we use, the slang of the day? Where does that come from? The culture around us. And, and culture changes. You know, it used to be things like neato and all that, and now it's cool. I think it's still cool. I don't know. What, what affects that? The world does. We, we shouldn't try to deny it because it's, there's no use in denying it. But we think to ourselves, well, I, I get my, my thoughts and ideas from the world, from these articles that we read and the, the videos that we're seeing online. We think about all of that, but that doesn't mean I love the world. I don't love it. I'm just interested. I just take my cues from that. But what does it mean to take a cue from that? We have to understand how much are we putting up with in our lives? And we'll make, you know, we'll make, we'll make exceptions. That we're willing to put up with this as long as it gives us something else in exchange. Well, I know it's not really good about this, but it's, it's got a good message behind it. Or, or whatever, whatever accommodation, whatever compromise we might make is. But understand, at the end of the day, you're still putting up with something that is not going to bring you closer to God. If you look at it, take a good, hard look at it, and understand this is coming from the world. What is it saying? What is it showing me? What is this presenting as the norm of this is what people do? And is that acceptable to God? And if we put up with that in our lives, then we are allowing it in. And sure, we say to ourselves, well, I know that's not right. And I'm not going to do that, but you're still allowing it in. And whatever we allow, whatever we put up with is exactly what's going to influence us. Over in Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> there in Ephesians chapter 4, starting over with verse 26. He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. We're not to give any opportunity. Other translations may say give no, no space to the devil. And there's so many different ways we can, we can phrase this. The age old saying that idle hands are the devil's playthings. If we have too much time on our hands and Satan's going to find a way to come at us. Satan is, as we say so often, he's good at his job. He is good at finding our weaknesses. He is busy. He is persistent. He doesn't give up. Why would we make his job any easier that we give him ample opportunity to come at us by surrounding ourselves with with people with media with all these types of things that are giving us the message of God's not important and faith doesn't matter you live your life here in this world care about the physical care about what feels good what sounds good what tastes good care about all of that and then maybe later on in life, then have a, a little bit of religion. That's generally the thought process that we see put behind it. And over here in Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, starting with verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And pay attention to these last two verses. It says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. In just these few verses, Paul covers a lot for us to take in. We could probably preach a whole sermon just on this, but just want to take a couple things from it. Number one, he goes over a list of what we need to be thinking about. Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is just, that's what we need to be thinking about. That's what we need to be filling up our mind with. 
Don't dwell on the things of, of this life. It's not to say ignore them or pretend that they don't exist, sweep them under a rug. Certainly not. But what are we dwelling on? What are we spending our time thinking about and caring about? It needs to be these things. But after telling him what he ought, after telling the Philippians what they ought to be thinking about, he tells them what they ought to be doing, what you've heard, what you've seen in me. Follow Paul's example. Follow Christ's example. He's our perfect example. So we're, we're being told these are the things we ought to be thinking about and these are the things we ought to be doing. That pretty much covers it. But in addition to that, he mentions there that as we ought to pray, as prayer is a regular habit of, of what we are and who we are, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In verse 7, he mentions the peace of God, which passes understanding. But you notice what it says it will do there. It says, we'll guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And it's that thought that we're really talking about right now. It's that thought that the lesson this morning is entirely concerned about, guarding our hearts and our minds. If we understand that the influence that comes from the world, that these thoughts, these words, these images that we're seeing that would affect us to take us away from God are coming at us, then the thought is we shouldn't allow it. And we need to be careful with what we allow. We need to guard our hearts and our minds. We need to be careful of what is coming into our lives and what we're putting up with. And we look at our lives and if there's something, doesn't matter how entertaining it might be, doesn't matter how, how popular it might be in the world, if there's something that is taking us away from God, that is you know, making us think about this life and that's the only thing that, that seems to be important, I don't think we need it. I don't think it's doing us any good. And we're told that, yes, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, that it will guard our hearts and our minds, but only if we allow it, only if we make prayer a regular habit. And it's not to say that God's the only one who can do this. We can guard our hearts and our minds. Of course we can. Who would ever say that we have no say in, in guarding our hearts and our minds? Of course we do. And we need to be doing it. We need to be careful about that. And again, we need to be extremely careful that we don't fall into this trap of, uh, I'll call it relative holiness. This idea that, well, as long as I don't love the world. We were talking about that before. You know, we look at, at other people who are just all consumed with this life. And we would describe them like demons, that they are in love with the present world. And then we look at ourselves and we say, well, I'm not them. You know, at least I... I go to services every week and at least I, I, I study my Bible we ought to never ever do that anytime we look at ourselves and we look at someone else and we start to make a comparison we've missed the point Jesus said in John chapter 21 starting there with verse 20 after Peter asks him a question it says Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had been reclining at table close to him. And it said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. What is that to you? If someone else is completely doing what is wrong. If someone else is making us look so much better by comparison, what is that to you? What they're doing in their life, they're going to answer for. What you are doing in your life, you're going to have to answer for. Don't think that you're okay because you don't define it as being in love with the world. You might not see it as love, but that's kind of subjective, isn't it? You might think, well, I, I don't love the world. I just like these parts of it. Well, what's that doing to you in your life? Isn't that influencing you in a way that is not according to God's word? Isn't that affecting the way that you think, the way that you talk? What ought to be affecting us? God's word. The Bible is what tells us right from wrong. It tells us how we ought to think, how we ought to speak. Let no 
corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is good for building up, for edification, to give grace to those who hear. The way the world affects us is directly proportional to how much we allow it to come into our lives. We have to understand that. We can't think that we let it all in and then be surprised when we're not living as godly as we thought we were, as we hoped we would be. It can't come as a surprise to us. But we talk about all this, and you know, therein lies the problem or the challenge is that that idea that we are to be in the world but not of the world. The challenge here for us is to not allow the world to creep into our lives, to not let it affect the way that we think and the way that we talk and the way that we act, to understand that our standard for that comes from God's Word, but at the same time, be out there in the world and trying to influence other people for good. And like we say, that's, that's a pretty tall order. That is a challenge because it's not a one-way street. You know, true communication, I, I was taught so long ago, is not someone, sitting, uh, someone standing up at a podium and lecturing. That's not communication. Communication is, is two-way. And any time we're around people, that's going to happen. We say something to them, they say something to us. Or even if not a word is spoken, just by seeing someone's actions, the way that they're dressed, the way that they carry themselves, they're sending a message. And as much as we would send a message to the world, we're hearing or seeing something from them. So it is difficult to be in the world and to not let that change who we are and how we live. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, looking there at verse 9, it says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But I am writing to you not to, you, not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater or viler, drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. And of course, we know he was writing to the church there at Corinth because they had a huge problem with, with fornication going on in that congregation. And he's writing to them here to withdraw from such a one, to not associate themselves with that brother. But he says there specifically, he says, I don't mean those of this world. He says, you know, to do that, he says, you would need to go out of the world. He's stating the fact you just can't escape it. There are going to be people in this, in this world who are sinful and who continue in that life of sin and aren't interested in God. And it might be people that we see at, at school, at work, or wherever we're going. We're going to be surrounded by that. There is no getting around it. Jesus said the same thing back in John chapter 17 as he is praying for his disciples there. <clears throat> Starting with verse 14, he's saying to the Father, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So Jesus is praying to the Father. He's saying, I'm not asking you that you take them out of the world. We are going to be in the world. It's what we have to do. We live for God. We live for Christ. He is our number one priority, but it doesn't change the fact that we live, eat, sleep, and breathe in this life. We get up in the morning. We have to go to a job. We have bills we have to pay. There are things <laughs> that have to be done. There is no getting around that. There is no escaping it. And this world is not perfect. There is sin in the world today. But that doesn't change what God has told us, what God has commanded. Yes, we are in the world. The only way to get around that is to not be here, is to be taken out of the world. But we're not to be of the world. We're not to be like that. We're to be different. We're to be better. 
the word sanctification comes to mind. It means something that is set apart for a specific purpose, to be holy. Jesus says we're to be holy as he is holy. If you wear the name of Christian, if you have come to a knowledge and obedience of the truth, then you know you're to be holding yourself to a higher standard. We are to be better than the world around us, not in that mindset that we are so much better than other people. That's never to be the way that we think. But we're to hold ourselves to a higher standard because we want to be pleasing to God. Because we know this world doesn't matter. This world is temporary. This world is filled with all kinds of bad things. It's not perfect. We want something better than that. We aim to be better. There in Colossians chapter 3, starting with the first verse. He says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in God glory the question is have we done this you know he starts that first verse by saying if then you have been raised with Christ and that's not a, a genuine if there he's being facetious he's writing to the church at Colossae he knows that they're Christians he says if you've been raised with Christ and they have he says that being the case seek the things that are above set your minds on things that are above what are we thinking about any given moment of any given day. What are we thinking about? What do we care about? What are our goals? What are our hopes? What are we looking forward to? He says, seek the things that are above. What does it mean to seek something? It means you want it. It means you're interested in it. It means you're doing something about it. You go out and you look for it. You don't just hope it'll come to you. You don't just wait around. You look for it actively, with a purpose, with a passion. Are we seeking the things that are above? And he's putting it plain and simple. If, if you've been raised with Christ, if you're a Christian, that's what you're supposed to be doing. And if you're not, then there's a problem. If you're not setting your mind on things above, if you're keeping your focus and your mind here on earth, that's all you're ever going to have. Jesus spoke about where our heart is, there our treasure will be also. What do we care about? What is important to us in this life? Like we said, sadly, as long as we're in this world, the way that the world influences us, the way that it will try to, to affect us, it's never going to reach zero. There's always going to be something or someone that is going to have an impact on us. But while we're not perfect, and it might not ever reach zero, that's no excuse for us to stop trying. And that's no excuse for us to just say, well, why bother? And as long as, as long as I don't love the world, we draw that very blurry line in the sand there, say, well, as long as I'm not as bad as Demas, or as long as some others that we can think of in our lives, people that we've known that are just consumed with the here and now, as long as I'm not that person, then I think I'll be okay. Where do we see that line of thinking from God's Word? Where do we see that kind of relativity? We don't. He says, you are to be holy, for I am holy. That if you are a child of God, then you're to live like it. You're to act like it. And we can't be fooling ourselves into thinking that we're in the world all the time and it's not going to have an effect on us. It does. And people can try to sequester themselves away, try to block out every source of, of temptation or corruption from the world. It doesn't work. Satan will always find a way to come at us. But if we tried to do that, Understand, we would also lose any effect we would have to try to change the world for the better. We're, we're not going to be taken out of the war. We can't get around that. While we're here, we need to be doing everything we can 
to try to influence others for good, to try to teach them about God's word. Show it in our words. Show it in our actions. Show it in our attitude. Show them that we care about more than just the here and now. Show them that we have a faith, a hope that is within us, and be ready to make a defense, to give an explanation for that hope with gentleness and respect. And that's how, again, that's how we're to let our lights shine in the world. But it's difficult to do that, to keep that up day after day and not let anything from the outside get in. And that's, like we said, that's hard. That's difficult. To look at our lives and say, well, no, it's not affecting me. It's not influencing me. But I know what, what God's word is. I know what the Bible says. You can know what the Bible says and still have things in your life that are trying to steer you away from it. It's, a, it's an interesting situation we find ourselves in. That we are in the world. We can't get around that. Not even if we try. But we're not to be of the world. And we're to go out there and we're to try to let that light shine so that others would see it and glorify God, but at the same time, not let all the glare that they're shining at us change the way we think, the way we act. What we need to do is stop and take stock of our lives, of how much am I allowing the world to come into my life. Like we said, no getting around it completely. But how much do we allow? How much do we put up with? How much are we openly inviting for the world to make us think? And the things that we're taking in, that we see from the moment we get up to the moment we go to bed, you know, what messages do we see there? Because there are some good influences out there. How much are we filling up our lives with that? These are the questions that, like we said, only you can answer. No one else knows our heart and our life. But think about it. In your life, how much of that influence is coming from God, from His Word, from His people, and how much of it is coming from those who don't know God, don't care about God? What is going to be better for us in the long run? With that, the lesson is yours for this morning. As we extend the Lord's invitation, as we do every time we come together, we invite those who have not been baptized into Christ or are still lost in their sins to make the change in their life, to put on Christ in baptism, to become a child of God. It's the most important decision anyone could ever make in their lifetime. And it is a lifelong commitment not to be entered into lightly or unknowing. <coughs> know what you mean when you say that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Know what it means to repent of your sins. Know the salvation that He offers, that forgiveness. And know what it means to be faithful unto death. And of course, no one comes up from the water knowing everything. And we're still not perfect. It's a process that we grow and we learn. And we do better from one day to the next. But that first step of submitting ourselves to Christ, to being buried with Him in that watery grave of baptism, it's something that we have to do. If you know God's Word, if you believe it, then repent of your sins. Put that old man of sin to death. Turn away from that Confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You can be baptized to rise to walk in newness of life. But maybe you've done that. Maybe you have made that decision, that you made that commitment in your life and you haven't been living as you should. You haven't been living up to it. Like we said, none of us are perfect. And we're not immune to sin or temptation. It doesn't matter how long. You've been a member of the church. 
If there's something in your life that is coming between you and God, take care of that. Change that. If there is sin, repent of that. Ask God to forgive you. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. Let us know. If you've sinned against someone else, a brother or sister in Christ, go to them. Confess that sin. Repent of that. Ask for their forgiveness as well. We may not be perfect, but we can do what is right. God doesn't ask the impossible of us. But we have this opportunity this morning for any who are subject to the Lord's invitation, whether they are outside of Christ and need to become Christians, or if they are erring Christians. You have now. You have this time, this opportunity. And we don't know if we're going to have another hour, another day. It's why every time we come together, we make sure to extend the Lord's invitation. Because we would hate for someone to be ready to make that decision, be ready to make that change and think that it didn't matter. It does matter. In a certain way of speaking, it's the only thing that matters. So if you need to become a Christian, if you need to be a child of God and you haven't done so yet, do so. There's sin in your life. Repent of that. Make that change this morning. You can have a seat on the front while we stand, while we sing.